Hey, thank you so much. And thank you all for having me and uh, being here to listen to us. I'm excited for this uh, talk for the next uh, hour. We'll go over some stuff and then have a nice discussion here with uh, Paul and Anand. And I hope you all enjoyed. So we're going to talk about diagnosis and planning here. I have no financial conflict of interest here. So quickly, what we'll do is go over the anatomy and biomechanics really quickly. We'll discuss the most portion of this is diagnostic workup, including both history, physical exam, as well as imaging. And then we'll talk about some indications for surgery before I turn it over to Paul. So everyone is familiar with the anatomy. The big structure here to think about is your inferior glenohumeral ligament. As we'll talk about with HAGO lesions, the anterior and posterior bands are very important along with the Glen along with the labrum. They provide us a static stabilizer for the, for the uh, glenohumeral joint as the labrum also increases the glenoid length and the width as well as the depth. And then along with the rotator cuff provide our stability in the shoulder. Despite this, we see a large portion of patients with uh, instability in large part because of the bony anatomy as such. The shoulder joint has been really uh, tied to the a golf ball and a tee concept, which provides us with a lot of uh, motion in the shoulder, but at the expense of instability. So anterior shoulder dislocations are the vast majority of shoulder dislocations that we usually see. In some studies, they account for about 98% of dislocations, um, but you always wanna be careful about looking for other things in there, including uh, things we'll talk about later, like rotator cuff injuries and whatnot. Um, you've gotta think about the capsule, and whether there's been a tear or stretch in the capsule. Uh, obviously, you will think about labrum tears and hill sacs lesions when you see these. Uh, this picture is very good. I like it because it really kind of focuses everything in one picture here. It, as you dislocate your shoulder anteriorly, you'll get your classic Bankart lesion, which is a tear of the labrum off the anterior rim. One of the things we're going to talk about later is focusing on identifying whether there is a bony Bankart lesion or a fracture of the glenoid rim. You also want to think about the hill sacs lesion posteriorly, as this could be, have a, a significant impact on how you plan uh, surgically uh, decision making. And also think about the Hago lesion, which is analogous to the Bankart lesion, but it's basically on the other uh, other side where you're going to get the avulsion uh, of the humeral ligament off the uh, humerus there, rather than off the glenoid surface there. So the diagnosis, when I see a patient with shoulder instability or presumed shoulder instability, I'm gonna first talk about the mechanism. I wanna make sure that this was truly an anterior dislocation or and make sure that it wasn't a posterior dislocation that has been lumped into being an anterior uh, instability episode. How did it go back in? Was it self-reduced? In which case this was maybe more of a subluxation and lesser traumatic injury, or if it was reduced by someone else, how long was it out for? The longer it was out for, the more likely I'm gonna think about neurological injuries. I'm gonna think about a larger heel sacs lesion and more significant impact onto the shoulder. Did the patient have any prior instability episodes? That's gonna be a significant impact uh, in terms of decision-making, whether or not we start talking about surgery right away, we start talking about other things first. Do they have generalized laxity? And if they do, when you can tell this on the other shoulder, if so, this may not have been a high mechanism of injury. It may have been a low mechanism, but really this is a multi-directional instability with a little bit of an injury. And you gotta start to make sure that this isn't uh, more of a, uh, a laxity issue rather than a traumatic issue. Do they have any weakness in the shoulder? And this will be important to really assess whether or not there's a rotator cuff injury, especially in our patients who are over 40. Um, but also you wanna make sure that there's no neurological injury. The longer the patient has been sitting out with their shoulder dislocated, the more you have to think about a brachial plexus injury, and in particular, an axillary nerve injury. And we wanna make sure we never miss these. And another thing you can ask for if there's any numbness in their arm anywhere, that would also clue you in to whether or not there is any sort of neurological injury. The physical exam, we're all very familiar with apprehension testing and instability testing with load and shift. You want to be careful about not jumping to the apprehension test too soon, uh, initially after an instability episode, as they may still be uh, unstable and uh, whatnot. Really what I want to do in that first uh, visit, I want to check their rotator cuff strength to make sure that there's not an injury to their cuff, especially in that over 40 patient. I want to pay particular attention to their range of motion. And in particular, I want to make sure that they have good external rotation at the side. I think everyone who's done enough shoulders has heard stories of patients who have come in to a reputable orthopedic surgeon and who has then missed a posterior shoulder dislocation uh, in large part because they didn't assess it uh, more detailed enough. What you will find in these patients who you think has had an anterior instability, if they still have a posterior dislocation that's still there, they will be missing significant external rotation at the side. So if someone comes in and they can't external ro rotate more, you know, beyond even neutral, you have to start thinking about a, a, a posterior dislocation that's been lumped as an anterior one. And in particular, from a neurological standpoint, I really make sure to test their axillary nerve. 
I do a full neurological exam the first time through, and then I can kind of forget about it if it's normal, but really the axillary nerve. And what I do is focus on the sensation of the lateral portion of the arm, but more importantly, I really want to make sure that all three heads of the deltoid are firing and firing equally to the other side. I will usually test this twice in these patients because if you do it the second time, you can pick up some subtle injuries where you might have a mild axillary nerve injury that could still impact your decision-making for timing and, and, and planning for surgery. So these are important things from a physical exam standpoint. So once you've passed that, the imaging is also very critical and can help you a lot. Now I'll say this twice, nothing beats good x-rays and you can learn so much from what you've learned from the history, the physical exam, and just a good set of x-rays that you may not need to do much else afterwards in terms of you know, decision-making. Uh, the x-rays, especially a good true AP and an axillary view are extremely important. And you wanna try and get as good of an axillary view as possible. The picture on the bottom right there is one that we take in our office frequently. Um, a lot of patients don't like it because they got to get pulled a little harder, but it does give me a great view. I can assess for a bony bank heart lesion. I can assess the hill sacs lesion and obviously assess whether or not their shoulder is located or not. A true AP view is also very helpful. I think a scapular wide view can provide some benefit, but nothing beats a good AP and an actual review. Uh, on the AP view, you can look to see here, and this is a point I want to point out here, if you can see my curse here, as you follow this glenoid rim right here, you follow it down, you can see this line, and about here, the line disappears right here. And this should immediately cue you into saying that there's some sort of bony damage here. Now in this view here, you can obviously see that the bone's sitting down here, and it's very obvious, but sometimes this bone will just migrate immediately. And if you're looking at an AP and don't have a great axillary, you may not miss, you may miss this and may not appreciate that there's some bony damage here unless you are knowing to look for this right here. If you don't see this line going all the way down, suspect bony bank heart lesion. And obviously this is good to see if there's a large hill sac lesion right there. Once you've identified this, you really wanna think about, is this a bony problem or still is it just a soft tissue problem? Because if it's a bony problem, our, our suspicion for imaging is going to, I mean, our decision making for imaging is going to change, and I will lean more towards a CT scan if I think there's more bony damage. What a CT scan does, it helps us to quantify the amount of bone. In a situation where you can't get an axillary review, it can tell us whether the joint is located or not. But really, when you have bone loss, you want to be able to quantify it because this can tell us from a decision making how we're going to approach our procedure, you know, whether we need to deal with Paul's surgical tips or whether it's going to be Anand who's going to tell us how to do a better open surgery, how big these pieces of the glenoid are, how big the hill sacs lesion is, is going to tell us what we're going to need to do, whether it's a remplissage, an arthroscopic bank heart, or whether it's an open shift with a ORF for the glenoid, or whether we're going to need to jump to a ladder J. The CT scan can give us a lot of this information. If we think it's not a bony issue, or if we think there's, there's a significant injury to the rotator cuff, I will then consider an MRI. If I'm not, if I'm not worried about bony injury, this is when I'll think about that. I, I will really do this to mainly assess for the rotator cuff. And in my situation also, because I can get it, I'll look to see if there's a Hagel lesion. Um, usually for, if someone can fix a Hagel lesion arthroscopically, or they have no trouble identifying it operatively. And just if they're in the lateral position, flip, flipping the patient supine and into the beach chair position, if they need to open it, then I think the, the need for the MRI, if you're convinced the cuff is intact, is really minimal. And you can get away with just x-rays and maybe an x-ray and a CT scan uh, if there's bony injury. But otherwise, if you have a good x-ray and you think it's a soft tissue injury and you're thinking surgery, you can probably skip this MRI. Now, if you're gonna get an MRI and the patient's you know, within seven to 10 days out from their injury, you can really skip the arthrogram as well because they still have some fluid in there that will be used as a natural arthrogram for these patients. Now, if you don't have uh, an MRI and you wanna to try to just assess for the rotator cuff, an ultrasound is a good alternative in this situation as well. So for indications for surgery, for first-time dislocators, and I think we could spend the entire time talking about first-time dislocators, but I'll give you my quick two cents worth. You know, For all first-time dislocators, I'll let the, the shoulder calm down, do a little rehab, make sure that everything kind of chills out. And this is assuming I have no nerve injury, no bony issues and no tears of the rotator cuff. I'll let them kind of chill out. And after about you know, three to six weeks, I'll see, see if they have any apprehension. If their apprehension has gone away, if I can move them all the way back and they have no issues whatsoever, then I'll consider again, you know, very easily going non-operatively. And if they're uh, in sports at that time, I will consider letting them back into sports. Age is also a factor, 20 and under, there's been many papers showing that these patients have a higher risk of uh, re-injury. I will talk to patients about that and their family members. If they are gonna be treated non-operatively, they need to know that they have a higher risk of re-injury. And if they have any sense of subluxation, feeling of instability before they dislocate again, 
I want to catch that and be able to operate on before they dislocate again. If they're 40 and over, I'm really just concerned about rotator cuff injury. And if they don't have a rotator cuff tear, I'm going to treat them non-operatively unless they prove that they're going to be uh, persistently unstable uh, or they dislocate again. Bony lesions will obviously be an indication for surgery as this is more likely to, de to develop into recurrent instability. And also a haggle lesion will be something for me that I would consider surgically operating is, you know, there are some good studies that show that those will be uh, dealt with better if they're fixed acutely rather than delayed. And again, for me, recurrent dislocations is usually a strong indication for surgery as is rotator cuff tears. So I just wanna briefly bring up the instability severity score. Pascal Bolo popularized this, and I think lately it's, it's gotten uh, some press as not being as, as accurate and as predictive of whether or not to do an arthroscopic versus ladder J. But for me, I don't always use this, but I like the principles that it presents. It makes you think about the age and the activity level of the patient. It makes you think about whether they're hyperlaxed or not. And it makes you think about bony injuries. So as long as you're thinking about all these things, you don't have to necessarily go through the ISS but if you're thinking about all these issues together into one position, one situation, you can decide from that, you know, and take all these into account whether or not surgery is necessary. So in conclusion, the physical exam and history provides very important information that you should not discount or glance over. Uh, nothing beats good x-rays. And if you have a bony lesion, a CT scan is usually my recommendation next to really quantify that in terms of surgical planning. Uh, an MRI is useful if you suspect a rotator cuff tear. You can, again, get an ultrasound as an alternative. And for surgery, I would say for persistent apprehension, for recurrent dislocations, for any kind of bony injury or for rotator cuffs, those would be my indications for surgery. Thank you. Thank you, 